Welcome to the Fertility Podcast. I'm Natalie Selfman, your host. I've been uh, using my voice in my work for about 15 years now. I used to be on the radio. Now I'm podcasting and do a lot of voiceover work. Now, the Fertility Podcast has a whole host of episodes for you from adenomyosis to zero sperm. It's total A to Z of all sorts of things that affect you on your fertility journey. I'm mum to a little boy called Phoenix after having successful ICSI treatment, and that was my reason for starting the podcast. Um, I hope that if you found us, then you'll realise that you are not alone. This podcast is to help educate and empower you. I brought together as many experts and try to share as many of your stories as possible and I now have my wonderful co-host. I'm Kate Davis, a fertility nurse consultant and I'm adamant that we can all do so much better at understanding our fertility. I'm really passionate about teaching you to take ownership of your fertility, teaching you practical steps, emotional coping strategies and lifestyle changes that you can make to hopefully optimise your chances of conceiving. Now you know who we are, all you need to do is enjoy the show. In this episode, it's a chat that I had without Kate with Claire and Becky, who I've joined forces with. You might have seen it on Instagram. We've created an initiative called Fertility Matters at Work. And here they are to explain more about what it is we're all hoping to achieve. So I'm now going to introduce two ladies who I am currently collaborating with to, well, ideally take over the corporate world in some way. You might have seen posts on social media with the new account, Fertility Matters at Work. And I'm going to introduce Becky and Claire, who are my partners in crime with the three musketeers who one step at a time are looking to change the mindset for a lot of kind of corporate people in how they deal with fertility issues at work. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hello. Now, we're all in different places. We didn't do this when we were together, and we're meeting up in a couple of weeks, but we've got so much other stuff to talk about. This podcast chat is happening in the remote in the remote <laughs> world of the wonders of podcasts. Are you both okay? <laughs> yeah, yes. good, thank you. The wonders of technology. What I thought would be lovely is... As a starting point, to just talk about the motivation behind what we've done, because, I mean, my reason was to try and to get a bit more understanding of it, having shared my own experiences a bit on social media, and I can talk about mine later. But, Becky, it's something that you've been talking more about. You're involved in the BBC Fertility Week, talking about your experience and, and your passion to help this conversation along, weren't you? Yeah, so I've been really passionate about this conversation sort of ever since I started blogging, really, because I had obviously my background in HR, but also my own experience of going through fertility treatment and the devastation of miscarriage as well. Whilst I was working, I actually found that part one of the hardest things to deal with, and also probably the biggest impact on a, a particular part of my life. So having now come out the other side I look back and I think there are so many things that could have been done differently and I listen to so many stories from other people where they feel like they can't speak out because there's no policy they don't know what reaction they're going to get they're misunderstood and they just are feeling so much more stress than they should need to feel whilst already on such a difficult journey and I just think there's a huge opportunity and a huge gap in education and training for organisations and if we can make fertility treatment slightly easier for those who are going through it in the future then what an amazing mission to to be on. And Claire you and I met when you'd already started your little IVF at work kind of profile on on social Mm -hmm. media. Tell me a bit more about your motivation and then I want us to talk a bit more about some of the points Becky you were just saying there. Okay, so mine, similar vein to Becky, I I too, obviously, am from a HR background. And I, 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 the best way I can describe me going through my IVF treatment is I bumbled through it. I think my manager bumbled through it when she finally found out what was going on when I finally confided in, in her because I was on my third attempt and I just thought, I just can't keep doing this on my own. And I spent so long as an employee just trying to work around appointments and try not to inconvenience work. And there was this whole sort of mental impact on me, if you like. Uh, There was a lot of emotion. There was a lot of anxiety created. 
And I just got really, really stressed out. And I just thought I just can't manage my day to day job because I'm in a middle management position and I couldn't manage the both. And it was just absolutely horrendous, so much so that I just thought something's got to give. And unfortunately, at that time, it was work and I took several weeks off work. And I look back when my daughter was five months old and I thought to myself, do you know what? This could have been handled so much differently. And it's just this massive gap, like Becky's already referred to. There's this gap in knowledge and education. And my policy at my last employer was just absolutely rubbish. It was, I think it was about two sentences about if you want fertility treatment, you can take some unpaid leave. And pretty much that was it. There was no reference to the psychological impact or the support that work could potentially give. And it was just just awful so same as Becky I thought you know something needs to change about this and there are other people going through this and hence I started my blog and my social media account and then I met you two lovely ladies. <laughs> you both talked about your experiences in the workplace and the impact it's had and, and I'd also shared a bit about my experience of, of being at work I didn't had, had no idea of who to turn to. You also have both talked about not having anybody coming to you asking for support whilst working in your role yeah. as HR professionals yeah. haven't you yeah I think I mean I've been in HR for 12 years and never once has anybody come to me to say what am I entitled to or a, a manager has never come to me to say oh a member of my team is going through this what can I allow which just speaks volumes really I think it's because a lot of people aren't telling their managers they're not telling HR because they worry about what the reaction will be and also, I think a huge thing is how they will be perceived for openly admitting that mm-hmm. they're trying to have a baby. And what comes with that is time off work. And there are so many kind of views out there that women in the workplace who aren't as important and because they're going to go off and have children. And, and so there's the assumption that they they may not be as committed. So mm. to actually openly say that to someone so early in your journey when you're feeling so vulnerable anyway is a huge thing for someone to take huge step to take and I was open myself and I think that's probably only because I work in HR and I I just felt that that was the way I should do it and I to be honest I don't know how I would have been able to hide the appointments because it was sort of a two-hour round trip to my clinic every two to three days and yeah so I just feel that people should have that opportunity to talk if they want to talk and for them to know that it's okay to tell their employer there needs to be a policy in place that that recognizes it. I think what Becky's saying now I totally agree with this isn't a one-dimensional issue so Becky's referenced the fact there that when you were in that vulnerable position it doesn't matter what level you are in in an organization you might want a career path and and the minute you open those conversations up you add another issue and another pressure and anxiety to your journey which is are people going to think I'm not committed it's like you can't be committed to your job and go through treatment and I think that's a very difficult thing for quite a lot of people not just females from for men and women in the workplace so what we're hoping to do is by bringing these points to the forefront increasing the conversation and the narrative around what needs to be thought about from an employer's point of view and an employee's point of view of what the conversation can be. Because every time we've talked about this individually and now as a as a kind of collaboration, we're getting a, a, a massive response from people, aren't we? And we're, we're gathering these examples, positive and negative, in a hope to help shed the light from an employer's point of view on the kind of issues people are facing, aren't we? Yes, yeah. there's there's been quite a lot. I mean, we were all monitoring all the different accounts. I was reading our email account thoroughly yesterday and the amount of people are reaching out to us and saying things like, thank you for opening up this conversation. It's incredible. It's quite empowering, really, that we've started this conversation and people are joining in. So I'm I'm exceptionally happy that people are finding solace in the fact that we're trying to change things. Mm. Yeah, and I I think at the time, it it just validates everything and just says to other people that it's okay to be struggling at work whilst you're going through this. I know I put so much pressure on myself and I felt like I was not only failing at being able to make a baby, I was failing at my job as well because I felt like I couldn't be 100% present. And, And it's through coming together and sharing those stories that those people will know that it's a totally normal reaction for it to have an impact on your mental health. And for employers to see the level of distress it can cause but also 
for them to be able to see that actually by providing some support and reducing this one part of the the kind of element of stress an employer can really make a difference to the journey and ultimately keep that employee in work productive and retain all of their knowledge experience and everything else that comes with it and one of the big kind of words with all of this is flexibility isn't it in the sense Mm -hmm. of enabling somebody Uh to have some flexibility and hopefully like you were saying Becky to retain these people because what we don't want is for people to feel that they have to sidestep opportunities because of what might be going on with their treatment alongside what might be happening at work because we've seen stories of people not going forward for promotions or not taking on a more stressful role because of the stress of the treatment so if we or leaving that or leaving leaving. they leave their jobs because they cannot balance the two things and I think that is the ultimate negative thing to happen to somebody if you're already in that situation where you're stressed and then you you have to leave work because you don't see another way out I just don't understand how that is a positive influence on their lives yeah and what we're trying to create here is a a, a place where you can share your experiences we're looking to be going into organizations offering training but also offering advice which you ladies have already been doing offering tips of conversation starters and things that you can suggest to your employers to hopefully empower you as well aren't we yeah and absolutely there's a huge huge gap and there are so many organizations in different places of work across the UK that we can't physically reach them all so to empower and give some some tips if you like for those that are going through it to actually be able to approach their employment and open a conversation which might change things for the future I think people who are going through treatment at that time are probably one of the best place people to to start that with their employer and challenge their employer um, about okay, with, I've got some facts here. There's one in six people are going through this in the UK. Why is this not recognised in a policy? What are you entitled to? Surely this is something you need to think of as part of your wider well-being and inclusivity policy um, and strategy. So, I, yeah, we're kind of hoping that by helping others, giving them advice and, and some tips that they can then almost help those in the future that are going through it by bringing it to light in the organisation, having the confidence to do so. I think the other thing that is, um, I think it's very important for those listening to this, that this is not all about the employee. We're, you know, we're we're there to support employers as well, because a lot of employers are in a massively competitive market at the minute. And there's a lot of uncertainty about now we've left the European Union and all that sort of stuff. And and people are competing against one another to be an employer of choice. And everything that Becky's gone over is about retaining the talent and about actually understanding what your generation of workers actually need your workforce needs change as time goes on and this is definitely something that's going to become more prevalent as time goes on and I think even if you can forward this little podcast to your HR person because we want to try and help with that education and one of the things I'm interested from both of your points of view is how easy is it then for a new policy to be implemented we're talking about you know we're we're talking about gathering what's going on from the employee point of view and we're trying to put it in front of the employer and say look we want to support you here's what's going on you both work in you know the creation of policy and and I'm interested in that shift in making this happen is it something that is going to take ages or can it can an employer go right yeah no we're gonna we're gonna get this happening i think that's dependent isn't it becky on Mm. what stakeholders you've got who's engaged who has an actual first-hand experience of this Uh, i think there's so many factors that influence that decision that i think it's very difficult from a hr perspective to answer that very easily because it will vary from organization and dependent on their challenges dependent on how forward thinking and innovative they are would you agree becky yeah, I would say, I mean, there's some organisations where you have to go through so many steps to get a policy signed off, mm-hmm. but the actual writing of the policy shouldn't take long. And it's one of the things we're going to offer. We're going to offer support with that and, and to do that for employers as well. A policy should be kind of in keeping with the rest of the organisation, the other policies, so using the same tone. But what we want them to be able to do, whether it's in a specific policy or at least within an absence policy or a flexibility at work policy, is to recognise that fertility treatment is something that people go through and it's a significant impact on their time and their mental health. And it's not and a so, lifestyle choice. They've not opted in. No, in no. <laughs> That's the big thing. That, and I've seen it where it's, it was in the same line 
as them talking about cosmetic treatment. It's like, yeah, if someone I've seen that. Cosmetic treatment for a, a non-medical reason or IVF, you can take annual leave. <laughs> and it just made me feel so angry that that person who read that when they're going through it would would have completely felt that oh I, I can't raise it with my employer because they obviously don't think it's a big deal mm. they think it's something I'm choosing to do and mm. nobody chooses to go through fertility treatment most of us would quite like to just have sex and make a baby <laughs> be a lot cheaper and it would be a lot yes less definitely <laughs> I mean I, I still don't understand how that actually happens but um, <laughs> Does that happen to you? I know. Who um, does that? Yeah, good point, Becky. It is true. But yeah, and so yeah, that's the bit that really, really great on me that, that people actually think we choose to go through it. No, we, we, we choose to have a family, but everyone should have the right to, to be able to build a family. Mm. And um, the majority of people who are going through fertility treatment are of working age. So it is a huge thing for employers to think about. I think it's a two-way conversation. Um, the employers need to be open to to support, but also one of the things I do always advise people is to start thinking of their own ways in which it would help them through that particular period. So don't just expect your employer to come to you mm-hmm. with solutions. Go to Go them to with them some solutions. With, yeah. yeah, be proactive, and that will probably give you more of an opening to talk about flexibility because at the end of the day, it's a temporary period, and... Yeah, I mean, you're talking about people leaving their jobs and the kind of consequences of their not being support is is huge for, for some people. And, mm-hmm. and for somebody leaving their jobs could be the meaning that they can't actually go through another IVF cycle because of the financial implications as well. And I mean, I personally took a sideways move into a less demanding role out of the succession pipeline because I just felt like I couldn't cope. And, and that impacted my career long term. Um, but... Yeah, it's just so that those who are going through it in the future don't have to be facing the same sort of unknowns and going into these conversations blind yeah. because that is the most stressful thing to have to go into your employer and, and start a conversation about something that's not even written down in any policy. You got one I think it's... Something... Yeah, one, one last thing to say, though. Sorry, Nat. Okay. I, I was just going to say as well, if, if you don't, if you can't confide in your direct manager, there will be somebody there that you can talk to, whether they exist in a different department. But please, I don't want anybody to be put off by the fact that they have an unsupportive line manager. There will be somebody in your organisation that you'll be able to talk to about it. Well, this is just the first in the Fertility Matters at Work conversations that you're going to be hearing on the podcast. So rest assured, we will be keeping you updated on our progress. We'll hopefully be bringing in some other voices along the way, maybe some of yours if you want to come and share your experiences. But do check out at Fertility Matters at Work on the social media platforms. We're most prominent on Instagram at the moment. We've just launched a new website. And yeah, just do get in touch. Our email is fertilitymattersatwork at gmail.com. And where possible, we are responding and we just really appreciating hearing from you. So, ladies, thank you. Thank you. And both of you have shared oh, with me pictures. Oh, God. <laughs> Claire, are you in a car? I'm in the Trafford Centre. Chris, Chris, Chris and Winter have gone shopping, and I'm sat with my headphones on with everyone walking past me thinking, oh, what is brilliant. that woman doing? <laughs> now, this is what you call dedication to a mission. So I, Definitely, definitely. You go, in, you go and do some shopping. Becky is Thanks. wearing her daughter's headphones. They're really good, Bex, those. You do look I couldn't great. find any of <laughs> I will share the pictures of both of them with the show notes for this episode rather than embarrassing them instantly on social media. Honestly, <laughs> Thanks, it's actually Nat. not as bad as I thought. So if you wanted to share it, it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm going to then. Fine. All right, lovelies. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. So if there's any issues affecting you at work, please do get in touch. Our email is fertility matters at work at gmail.com make sure you follow the account at fertility matters at work on instagram we're building up the facebook and the linkedin pages as well and we are really keen to just get as many voices involved and as many employers as well if you're an employer listening to this and you want to understand more about what you can do to get the right kind of fertility policy in place in your workplace then again get in touch and we can talk more for now though be sure to rate review subscribe and share this podcast you know that we love the love that you give you can follow me at fertility poddy on my socials kate is at your fertility journey and we'll both be back next week so until the next time 